Okay, hey, I'd like to call to order the uh, regular meeting of the Quincy School Committee of Wednesday, December 7th to order. Would you please stand for a pledge? Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mayor Koch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Today is a very historic day in our nation's history, being the 7th 7th uh, with the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. Uh, I think it's appropriate we take a moment to uh, remember the sacrifices made, those that died at Pearl Harbor, but subsequent to that, uh, I think of the men and women who were leaving our high schools, uh, 16 and 17 year olds, lying to get into the service to defend our freedoms. And Tom Brokaw talked about them being part of the greatest generation, growing up in the Depression, fighting to save freedom in our world, and then coming back and actually building our country. So if we could take a moment, remember those uh, folks that defended our freedom. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Before we get going, uh, pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Okay, at this time, uh, I would take a motion to approve the regular yeah, minute. Oh, sorry. Call the roll, please, Superintendent. Mr. Bagoli? Present. Mrs. Cahill? Present. Mr. Gutro? Present. Mrs. Hubley? Present. Mrs. Lebo? Present. Mrs. Santoro? Present. Mayor Coe? Present. Okay, now I'll take a, a motion to approve the regular minute meetings of November 16th. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Mrs. Hubley, seconded by Mrs. Lebo. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Item B, executive session minutes for November 16th. On a motion of Mr. Gatro, seconded by Mrs. Cahill, we approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And the ayes have it. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session uh, by way of moving item nine out of order so that we may have a level three grievance as well as contract negotiations. Do I hear a motion? I believe it, it was two separate motions. Okay, and the Chairman, first a motion, motion to take it out of order. Uh, on a motion to take item nine out of order, uh, is there a motion? So moved. Moved by the mayor, seconded by Mrs. Hubley. Superintendent, call the roll, please. Mr. Bagoli? Yes. Mrs. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gattro? On the motion. Yes, on the motion, Mr. Gattro. My sense is that we have a lot of people who want to testify tonight. Is th this is pressing to do, do this first? It is. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mrs. Santoro? Yes. And Mayor Coke? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll now make a motion that uh, we go into executive session to discuss level three grievances and contract negotiations with the understanding we'll be coming back to public session. Okay. And a motion of the mayor, seconded by Mr. Bregoli. All those in favor? Roll call. Um, roll call vote. Mr. Superintendent? Mr. Bregoli? Yes. Mrs. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gattro? Yes. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mrs. Santoro? Yes. And Mayaco? Yes. Okay. At this point, we would ask that um, you leave the room. There are seats across the hall. We will be coming back. Session. Um, at this time, I'd like to read the open forum um, statement on our agenda. This is an opportunity for community input regarding the Quincy Public Schools community. In this context, uh, the community is defined as a resident of the city of Quincy, a parent of a student who attends Quincy Public Schools, or an employee of the QPS. Non-community persons not permitted to speak at open forum may submit written statements to the school committee, and after giving his or her name and address, each speaker may make a presentation of no more than four minutes to the school committee. An individual may not exchange their time or yield to others. Interested parties may also submit written statements to the uh, QSCO open forum at quincypublicschools.com. At this time, I would ask anybody who would like to speak at open forum to come forward to the standing mic. Do I have anybody to speak? 
Yes. Please state your name and address. Sure. My name is Kate Campbell. I live at 37 Cranch Street in Quincy. And I first want to thank you for your service. I share my thoughts as, as it's important that a community works together in solving issues that impacts its members. My children have been in Quincy Public Schools for 12 years. More than enough time to recognize the considerable strength and talent our teachers bring to this district. I stand here tonight in support of our educators. I'm simply struggling because we are asking them to care for other people's children, yet we are not allowing them reasonable parental leave to care for their own. The current parental leave, more accurately is described as medical leave, is not fair or just, and sends the message that this majority female profession deserves less than others in their profession. My other concern is related to CAPS. Allowing professionals to work in a system that puts no caps on the number of children they serve sends a clear message that our special education system chooses to ignore best practice. Operating from a deficit model, we will never be competitive in hiring, allowing us to recruit the best and the brightest in this field. I attended parent-teacher conferences yesterday. I love the high school. I love the teachers, right? I was impressed with every teacher I met. But the whole time was I was there, I could not shake how devaluing it must feel to be them right now. Having to fight for what is right, fair, and equitable, and being offered by many of our other surrounding communities, please do the right thing for our children and support our teachers in offering a fair and equitable contract. Thank you. I feel you, Pam. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Gina Favada. I live at 151 Fenno Street. Um, I have a fifth grader at Beachwood Knoll. When I send my child to school every day, I must trust the teachers and staff completely, and I do. I entrust them with her care and well-being and to provide her with a good education. I am grateful for everything they do. And now, teachers are doing their jobs without a contract. So it is only fair that I stand up for them when they are not getting the contract that they deserve. First, thank you for offering our teachers a fair wage increase. But anyone who has ever worked for a union knows, and I know as a former union worker, that the devil is in the details of the contracts. Those little details are the pieces, pieces that keep people in their jobs, protect workers from unfair practices. The details are the quality of life pieces, pieces that keep employees from burning out and moving on. <coughs> lead, longevity pay and caseload caps are details that matter. QPS's current parental leave policy is outdated, discriminatory, and not competitive with surrounding districts and other city unions. Six weeks of unpaid leave, unless they have sick time to use, is completely unreasonable. And then on top of that, not, knowing, not allowing teachers to donate sick time to colleagues who are new parents is just beyond unjust. I believe that most of the members of the school board are parents, right? Quincy moms and dads. Do you remember what it's like leaving your newborn? Sure, the teachers could stay for 12 weeks, stay out for 12 weeks without pay, but who can afford to go unpaid in today's world with current inflation? It's a sacrifice that these teachers make for our kids, for my kid, but a sacrifice that shouldn't have to, they shouldn't have to make. It starts to look like we, as a community, don't value our teachers or new parents, and it especially looks bad considering the QPS workforce is predominantly female. We can do better. As for the caseload cap, without a cap on the number of students for our special ed EL teachers, psychologists, and adjustment counselors, these specialists will burn out and move on. We will have a hard time hiring new teachers in these positions because many towns around us do have a cap on caseloads. But most importantly, our most vulnerable kids will be affected. They won't be getting the services they so desperately need, that they are required to have. And I know a number of parents who are saying that their kids are already not receiving their services because our specialists are overloaded with kids because we have open positions that we can't seem to fill. This is an equity issue, a total disservice to our most vulnerable that can be easily fixed in this contract. The last thing I wanna talk about is retention and longevity pay can be a tool to help retain your best teachers, to help them from wandering to other towns with better incentives or from quitting the industry altogether because of burnout. 
Without strategies to retain your teachers, they will be more likely to leave. They are already leaving. I can't speak to how teachers are personally feeling about working without a contract, but if I were a teacher, I'd feel like I didn't matter and was just a number. <coughs> kids seeing familiar faces at schools have, kids seeing familiar faces at school, having continuity, having teachers who know families from older siblings and know the rhythm and flow of Quincy and the schools is so important. It's a small thing that goes a really long way. And good longevity pay is a simple tool to help retain our, our veteran teachers. My family moved to Quincy 14 years ago. We're raising a little Quincy girl who loves her hometown. Part of what brought us here was the solid schools. If we start losing our best educators because it appears we don't value our teaching staff, it will affect the quality of our schools. I promise you that. And that won't just be a loss for our kids. It will affect the city at large, eroding the desirability of our community and impacting home values. Families who can afford to will start moving away, and new families won't replace them. Please reconsider the contract you're offering our beloved teachers. They deserve better. How you value our teachers reflects how you value our kids, and our kids deserve better. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jennifer Chen. I live at 28 Barber Terrace. I'm here as a QPS parent in solidarity with the QEA. I ask that negotiations continue towards a fair contract for our teachers and for the benefit of our students. We have all likely been impacted by an exceptional teacher in our life, a teacher who nurtures, inspires, motivates, and challenges each student and brings out their best in the classroom and beyond. From kindergarten to now high school, my children are thriving in the Quincy Public Schools. Their teachers, more than anything else, have had the greatest impact on their educational experience. Their exceptional teachers are the reason they are thriving in the Quincy Public Schools. Without teachers, there would be no Quincy Public Schools. Our teachers deserve a contract that reflects Quincy's commitment to accessible, high-quality public education a contract that justly compensates, values, and respects the skills and expertise of our teachers, a contract that retains our most experienced, exceptional educators, as well as attracts new ones. I believe that the best way to support our students is to support our teachers. The QEA deserves a fair contract. Supporting Quincy students means supporting Quincy teachers. Thank you. My name's Amy Bakary. I live at 21 Hobomack Road. I'm a proud parent of two Quincy Public School students. Um, and Quincy Public Schools are very near and dear to my heart, not just because I'm a parent, but because I was a dedicated employee of Quin Quincy Public Schools for 18 years, who made the difficult decision last year to leave Quincy Public Schools because I had to resign because the workload and the stress load was actually unsustainable for our family. Um, my husband, Roger, however, is still a math teacher at Quincy High School who works incredibly hard and is devoted to helping his students succeed and thrive. Because of these factors, I think I'm uniquely qualified to comment on how incredibly difficult and taxing, and it is demoralizing, um, this job can be and how complex the needs of this district actually are. And it's become significantly more difficult over the course of the past two, two, two decades as, since I first entered the classroom. When I started in QPS in 2003, my workload was challenging, but it was manageable. After the large layoff in 2010, class sizes ballooned, and they never returned to that pre-2010 level. As an English teacher, this increased my lesson planning and grading load significantly. There were years when I had upwards of 120 to 130 students, which added hours of planning and grading time to my plate. It was not uncommon for me to average about four hours of sleep in order to stay on top of my workload. In addition to teaching my students to read, write, and critically think, I was a source of support for my students, providing mentorship to them <coughs> and countless college recommendations. I was a super fan at their sporting events and drama productions. I chaperoned their dances and attended their fundraisers. And all of that was unpaid time that I dedicated to the students of this community, something that every single teacher I know does for our students because we care about them. But this was unsustainable and I burned out. There simply weren't enough hours in the day and support from the district to continue doing my job well. Fast forward to today. My former colleagues are asking for help to address the working condition issues that are driving teachers like me to burn out and to leave. They're asking for things that are not only reasonable but necessary. They are the ones who know what the district needs, so why are we not listening to them? 
They're asking for support. They desperately need to make this job manageable and ultimately better for our children. If we do not address these conditions as a community, many more teachers will leave. They are already leaving the profession at record numbers. <coughs> I have never seen so many educators leave in the middle of a school year for other districts who offer better working conditions and benefits or for jobs outside the profession altogether where they find better compensation and respect for the important and extensive skill set that they have. I personally know of many more former colleagues that are barely holding on and seriously considering leaving. I'm extremely concerned by what is happening and about who will even be left to teach my children if we continue in this vein. As a parent, I'm asking you, the elected school committee, to do right by my children by doing right by their educators. I'm pleading with you to actually address their needs and concerns and to come back with a fair contract that actually reflects those needs and concerns, one that retains and attracts quality educators and fosters the type of schools that our children deserve. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Melissa Ritchie. I live at 71 Barber Terrace. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you tonight, and I thank you for all of your hard work and your service. I have two kids at Marymount Elementary School where teachers and staff go above and beyond to ensure that kids are getting what they need. Mrs. Eckhart, Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Colloran, Mrs. Condi, Mrs. Ryan, Mr. Rogan, there's so many. And they're just a, that's just a few of the many staff who dedicate countless hours to help my children feel both, ch both challenged and cared for at school. For example, without Mrs. Eckhart's and Mrs. Brown's help, my fifth grader would not have made it to fifth grade in one piece. And thank goodness she did make it to fifth grade because the fifth grade teachers at Marymount are model teachers who inspire their students to become lifelong learners. And then there's Mrs. Colloran, a first grade teacher at Marymount who met with my younger daughter before school every week during Mrs. Colloran's own time in the middle of hybrid learning uh, to help my daughter with her reading and writing. Since second grade, Mrs. Ryan, a special education teacher, and Mrs. Condi, our guidance counselor, with their enormous workloads, have somehow managed to continue to help my daughter access the reading and writing support she needs. Speaking of Mrs. Ryan, my daughter's special education liaison, I'm astonished at how high some of the caseloads and workloads are for special education teachers, guidance counselors, and other related service providers in Quincy when I compare it to nearby towns. I'm a speech language pathologist. I work in a nearby school district. I've been able to speak to my own colleagues, some of whom work in Quincy. My kids are lucky to be at Marymount. They're getting what they need. However, there are many schools in Quincy where caseloads and workloads are so high that Quincy is out of compliance. And with specialists and teachers leaving Quincy schools, things are only getting worse for our staff and therefore for our kids. Many related service providers, like speech language pathologists, are dealing with caseloads of more than 80 children at some of our Quincy schools. That is not okay. Of course, the SLPs and other service providers in our schools are leaving Quincy to go to other towns. Of course they are. Please don't tell us that parent, tell all of us here, the parents in Quincy, that the reason for these vacancies is the labor shortage. This has been going on for a long time in Quincy. These high caseloads and workloads have been a problem in Quincy I, I, for countless years, for a long, long time. Until the caseloads and workloads become reasonable, we are not going to draw the talented teachers and staff we need to come work for us. We're not going to keep the talented staff that we already have. I am deeply concerned, but unfortunately not surprised, to learn that so many of our experienced and dedicated teachers are leaving Quincy to work in nearby towns. Quincy parents with kids in the school system should be paying attention to this trend. To any parent who might be listening right now, if you are unhappy with anything that is going on in your child's school, if you are worried that your children are not getting what they need, if your child is one of the many vulnerable kids on IEPs who are not getting the services they need, you need to understand a few things. When we complain to our children's teachers, special education providers, guidance counselors, even our principals, there's not a whole lot they can do at the building level. There simply aren't enough positions at our schools to give our teachers a fighting chance to be successful. It's time for parents to start talking to our city officials at the Coddington Building. If we want our children's education to improve for our kids' IEP goals to be met, then we need more positions to be created in Quincy schools. Of course, this takes money. Money that our leadership doesn't seem to think should be spent on our children. We all know the population in Quincy has been growing. 
why wasn't a plan put in place to hire more teachers and retain the quality teachers we already have? Staff in Quincy schools have been asking for better working conditions for years. What is your current plan to prevent more teachers from leaving Quincy? You're over four minutes, ma'am. Can you wrap up? Yes. So our taxes have increased each year. There's been quite a bit of funding coming to this town earmarked specifically for our schools. We need to know how this money is being spent. And we need to know, we need to know what the plan is to prevent more teachers from leaving Quincy. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mari Medeiros, 12 Woodford Lane, Quincy, Mass. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and School Committee. I come here today as a parent and a proud union teacher of over 25 years and a QPS mother to say that this is all just unacceptable. The city of Quincy has received $88 million in COVID relief money, and $25 million explicitly for Quincy Public Schools. Where is that? None of these suggestions come without a price tag. We know that. But it is all in the best interest of our city and our students. Cost prohibitive and the cost of children and education is just an utter oxymoron. We need to value our students with every opportunity possible, and by doing that, we value our teachers. In the terms of class size limits, in order to meet each child where they are at, teachers need support. <coughs> Teaching is an art of labor, training, and utmost love. We need to start with that with our esteemed teachers. Teachers need class size caps for special education. Special education is the spine in service delivery requires time to create, modify, and make all the accommodations each child needs to reach their personal best. Related service providers give service minutes per the IEP, and they also need time to create individualized, specialized instruction so students can access their curriculum. Teaching is all about planning and preparation. Time needs to be valued to give the providers time to create highly specialized materials for our students. These are not whole class, one size fits all suggestions. These are legal documents of which the city will need to be held accountable to for creating the space, the support, the time for the teachers to make these fruition into action. The city is creating hundreds of IEPs <coughs> which are instantly out of compliance, not matching service delivery grids and consultation times. This would cause a massive DESI investigation. Hiring more teachers is always the right answer. Honoring IEP minutes, reducing class size, and lower class ratios is the first place to start. Mental health supports. After 2020, we have learned that mental health supports are the foremost need in every child. Guidance counselors should not be running IEP teams. It is a misplacement of resources. Special education chairs should be creating the IEP and the service delivery grids. Guidance counselors should be part of every team, and we need as many counselors available for acute and long-term <clears throat> mental health support. It needs a system reorganization to create these needed changes in order to bring the right services to the students. Educational roles of guidance, adjustment, and counselors are different, specific, and unique positions that need to be held in fidelity and not kind of smooshed together, causing inefficient services for all of our children and families. Teacher retention. Honoring veteran teachers is imperative to our teacher retention. QPS needs to create career awards for allegiance to their city, their schools, and their students. Valuing years of hard work and dedication is critical for keeping veteran staff. Teaching is continuing to learn, to grow, have a solid toolbox of options that meet each learner where they are at. That type of commitment comes from hard work and devotion. This is how we increase rigor and high expectations for all by having a large way to instruct all students. Increase of salary lanes. Teachers continuously have to keep learning. We take classes, we take professional development, training, seminars, conferences, all out of our own personal time and most of it, our own personal money. Why? Because we love what we do. You're over the four time. minutes, ma'am. If you would wrap up. We have to have a minimum of a master's degree to continue on, and we need to honor those credits. And the parental leave is, just as everyone else has said, unacceptable. 
So I proudly stand with my Quincy Education Association brothers and sisters as a union teacher with many suggestions on how this can be done better for all of our students. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Liz Speakman, 129 Marymount Road. I have two children. One is also at Marymount School. Um, and I'm the co-chair of the citywide uh, PTO, along with uh, my friend Kate. And when we put out the call to parents to say, hey, you know, there's some disputes happening with the Quincy Teachers Union, and we're curious if any parents have thoughts or opinions about that. It took about one minute for parents to step up and say, we stand with our teachers. What do they need? And that's because we love our teachers. We love them. We went through the pandemic together, and it is an unexplainable experience to parent during a pandemic. No one that hasn't done it could ever imagine what it's like. And our teachers stood side by side with us. They relearned their whole way of their profession, and they supported us, they supported our children through an unimaginable trauma, and we are here to stand with them. When they say they need something from us as a community, from us as parents, we stand ready to say, what do you need? How can we help? And that is the showing that we have here tonight and the many letters that we got submitted. And these are the courageous folks who are willing to speak publicly and the folks who had childcare and who weren't having to work. There are so many other parents out there who don't have the capacity or ability to show up here tonight that stand with our teachers because we love them. And we are so grateful for every minute that they put into our kids. When you have a child, many of you know that you will do anything for your child. You will do anything to make sure that they are healthy, they are happy, they have everything they need to move into the world as successful, happy, healthy adults. And that's what our educators are doing and that's why we're standing with, with them tonight. And so our ask is stand with us. We are all in this together. As I mentioned last time, a budget is a value statement and I know we all value our children. So let's reflect that in the budget, in the contract, in our communications with each other. Let's bring civility, respect, um, mutual understanding and compromise to this whole process because we are all in this together. We are a community. We are all parents. Some of you are grandparents. You know what it's like to struggle and make sure that your little ones have the best they need. And that's why we're here today, not to be in opposition to anyone, but to be standing together and showing our community that we value our children, we value our educators, we value our families, and we are gonna show that through our actions. Thank you. Anybody else for open forum? My name is Tere Rodriguez. I live in Six Downs Road. I have two children in the public school system, one in middle school and the other one in high school. Um, I'm here just in support of all our, of our teachers. Um, they have been instrumental in the life of my children and uh, I cannot thank them enough uh, for everything that they have done for my kids. You know, the attention to uh, noticing that one of them, you know, might need, you know, extra help, that uh, the other is, you know, like um, needs the support and also uh, encouragement to continue excelling in her classes. Uh, everything comes down to a personal, um, relationship, you know, they are really, and the people that are, you know, spending most of, more time that they are spending even with their own parents. Um, they are, you know, we're, we're living in different er, uh, days now, you know, our children, uh, our teachers are really not just delivering, you know, like um, learning experiences, but uh, nowadays, obviously, they are you know, receiving even, you know, they have to think of what we have just gone through with the pandemic. They, you know, with these nowadays, things that are happening in classrooms and schools, they receive like even trainings that if we go back years or decades ago, we would have not even imagined that we would put our teachers, you know, to a specific trainings to defend our children in the classrooms. They are everything to us. We're delivering our treasures, you know, every day to them. 
and I'm just here to stand with them for a fair contract. Thank you. Anybody else for open forum? Seeing none, we'll continue on. Uh, we still have some letters that need to be read. Yes. Mrs. Owens. Hey, I have uh, nine letters uh, to read that were shared through the open forum uh, email address. The first is from Joe Heresy. I am a longtime resident of Quincy, Quincy for Transformative Change Organizer, retired educator, and current MTA volunteer organizer and board of directors member. I am urging you to negotiate in good faith with the Quincy Education Association. Refusing to pay educators for 18 additional days of teaching is unacceptable. Eliminating all guaranteed rights to parental leave for educators is unacceptable. Longevity pay that is a small fraction of that of other nearby school districts is unacceptable. Educators' working conditions are the students' learning conditions. This is not just a slogan, but an objective fact. Unlike the mayor and school committee, educators work with the students every day, and they know what is needed to do the job. Though some have tried to demonize educators, we are finding out in communities like Brookline, Malden, Haverhill, and Melrose that, in fact, they are respected and trusted, Quincy educators deserve a contract, and it is the obligation of the school committee to negotiate in good faith to this end. Educators live up to their responsibilities every day, and it is time for you to do the same. The second letter is from Maggie McKee. Dear school committee members, consider these facts from a Bloomberg story published in September. A Gallup poll in February showed that K-12 educators were the most burned out segment of the U.S. labor force. A study by the National Center for Education Statistics in March found that 44% of public schools reported teaching vacancies. By LinkedIn's calculations, the number of teachers who quit in June was almost 41% higher than a year earlier. Almost two in five teachers plan to quit in the next two years, according to a June survey of members of the American Federation of Teachers Union. Chief among the reasons are salaries that haven't kept up with inflation, student behavioral problems that have gotten worse during the pandemic, and a lack of respect as schools have become the latest political battleground. A report from the National Education Association found that starting salaries averaged $41,770 for the 2021-20, sorry, for the 2020-2021 school year, a 4% decrease from the prior year when adjusted for inflation, and the lowest in at least a decade. <clears throat> These requests, I'm sorry, um, I'm supporting Quincy by supporting our educators' requests in their contract negotiations. These re requests include a comprehensive parental leave policy, limits to class sizes and caseloads, competitive compensation and grading practices that allow for more long-term projects rather than multiple choice tests. If you were a teacher, wouldn't you want your school committee members to support these requests so you could best meet the needs of your students? There is a glaring disparity in the treatment of teachers compared to that of police and firefighters. Contracts with the latter unions made their members the highest paid city employees in 2020, thanks, more than, thanks to more than 10 $2 million in overtime pay, according to the Patriot Ledger. The city negotiated contracts that give police and firefighters lucrative overtime pay and is building them a future headquarters whose cost has ballooned to more than $170 million while teachers are fighting for a paid family leave that state law guarantees to employees in most other professions. This is a very inequitable way to treat teachers who are overwhelmingly women compared to police and firefighters who are overwhelmingly men. Our children need good teachers, and teachers deserve the salary, benefits, and perks afforded to, for example, police and firefighters. Please do everything you can to support teachers' requests in their contract negotiations so we can attract and retain talented educators. The city's future literally depends upon it. The third letter is from Jennifer Freeling. Dear Mayor Koch and Quincy School Committee members, it is with great concern that I write to you. We have made it through a very difficult couple of years as a community, and if the COVID-19 pandemic taught us anything, 
it, is sure, it surely taught us the invaluable importance of public school educators to not only our children, but to our community and the entire economy. Public schools in Massachusetts and the greater United States are experiencing a severe shortage of educators. This is not new information, but the pandemic certainly expedited and exacerbated an already tenuous situation. Given the dire straits that our schools are experiencing and coming out of a period of time that highlighted their needs so starkly, now seems like a terrible time to nickel and dime our educators. Our educators need respect, they need support, they need time, and most importantly, because teaching is a job, not a charity, they need money. The city of Quincy has received $25 million in COVID relief funding from the federal government that is supposed to be specifically allocated to the public schools. With that funding, the funding of the Student Opportunity Act and the now passed Fair Share Amendment, there is absolutely no reason for our city not to make deep lasting investments in our school system. And those investments should center around school personnel and facilities, more educators, mental health workers, support professionals who actually make a living wage, along with well-maintained buildings and facilities. As a taxpayer, homeowner, and a parent of a Quincy Public School student who is at the beginning of his career and another who hasn't even begun his yet, I expect that our elected school officials will invest in our school system and our teachers so that my children and all the children of Quincy can experience a rich education from the dedicated educators that serve our community. Please settle this contract and give the educators what they deserve and need for our children and community. Our educators do not deserve another minute of uncertainty and disrespect. The next letter is from Martha Sheridan. Dear school committee members, as a recently retired grade five and six elementary teacher from Acton Boxborough School District, I valued the time I was given to plan lessons and to collaborate with my grade level colleagues during the school day. I knew I was respected as a teacher in that school system. I had every special art, music, physical education, library, and lunch times available for personal classroom planning, meetings, or for reviewing student work in order to give individualized and prompt feedback. We also had one and a half hours of grade level planning time weekly for our project-based learning curriculum. It was during the school day every week. This time was invaluable. Collaboration time increases creativity and inspiration through the sharing of ideas, distributes the load for planning, decreases teacher burnout, and ensures time to develop well-planned lessons and meaningful assessment tools for the children. Please give our Quincy Public Schools teachers these advantages so they can teach our children in the best ways possible. The next letter is from Lindsay and Alex Robertson. In February 2020, when my family moved back to my home state for my spouse to begin a new job in Boston, there was one place for us, Quincy. The reason? Good schools, on the T. We found the perfect apartment with impeccably wonderful landlords, a beautiful neighborhood, and then a pandemic hit. We were so grateful to be in Quincy with Faxon Park close by to get us through the long, lonely days of the pandemic. This fall, our child began kindergarten in the community school. We were thrilled as we should be. We'd made friends at Faxon and Thomas Crane that spoke so highly of Quincy and her schools. The goal was to be achieved, good schools on the tee. But wait, school began and as Halloween passed, talk of contract negotiations going poorly reached me. I was stunned. Didn't the city receive COVID funding to support our educators for making the hard pivots of the pandemic? The facts floored me. Elected officials are denying paid parental leave, denying teachers the ability to use accrued sick time to care for family members or to extend their parental leave, offering paltry retention pay and trying to expand classroom size. This is unbelievable and disgusting. How could a school board in 2022 deny teachers these bases, basics? After a pandemic, why is our city failing our educators? That's why I'm writing in support of our educators today to keep Quincy as a city with good schools on the tee. It's the reason I hiked the, it's the, reason I hiked the hills in Squantum and braved gusty days on the neck. To do this, is, and the only way is to have this is by taking care of our teachers. Our teachers know what's best for our schools and the best way to educate our kids, so give them what they deserve. Our educators deserve paid parental leave, our educators deserve to use their accrued sick time. 
Our educators deserve competitive retention pay. Our educators deserve reasonable class sizes. Our educators deserve, or excuse me, our kids deserve educators that are able to care for themselves and their families. This is how a community works, and we parents cannot do any of this community thing without them. By denying the requests of our teachers, the Quincy School Board is quite loudly proclaiming that the families of Quincy do not deserve good teachers and good schools. If the board does not deliver what our educators deserve, then they don't deserve to represent the people of Quincy. The next letter is from Audra McCush. Dear school committee members, I'm the mother of a child at Quincy High School and two at Marymount Elementary. Quincy educators support, educate, and protect our children. As far as I'm concerned, it is the most important public sector job in the whole city. So it comes as a sincere disappointment that the Quincy School Committee hasn't figured out how to settle a fair contract with the QEA. The demands of the educators, especially paid family leave, are basic and fair. It's embarrassing that the people we charge with taking care of our <coughs> children can't have reasonable, reasonable paid time off to care for theirs. In the past couple of years, I have heard of teachers leaving QPS in significant numbers. In fact, a friend of my daughter's recounted a teacher of hers leaving in the middle of a class period. It's hard to imagine why the school committee wouldn't do everything to, possible to support and shore up the remaining educators. What is good for teachers is good, student, is good for students. The members of the school committee are charged with the serious, important task of running our schools. Failure to settle this contract reflects badly on the tenure of the school committee members and the mayor. Please do the right thing for our teachers and our students and settle a fair contract now. The next letter is from Rishi Tandon. Dear Quincy School Committee members, I write this letter with a lot of anxiety and fear for my child who is currently an elementary student of Quincy Public Schools. I feel the current environment in the schools where the teachers are not happy with their working conditions is very detrimental to her well-being and future. If the teachers are unhappy, then it's almost impossible for the students to perform to their potential. Students have lost two years to COVID, and this year is becoming equally challenging, but for problems that have a solution. I don't think it's fair to my child and all the children in Quincy Public Schools to be in a situation where their future is at stake for no fault of theirs. Many of my friends are moving with their children to Hopkinton and Sharon, as these are supposedly better school districts than Quincy. I love Quincy for its vibrancy, its potential of growth, and its teachers, but I am seriously considering moving as the current situation in schools is robbing my child to perform to her potential. It's heartbreaking that our students are struggling because our teachers are struggling. I have personally witnessed how the current situation is impacting the quality of education for my child and for my friend's children in the system. I have written this letter with a lot of sadness as I am slowly losing hope in continuing in Quincy Public Schools as it's painful to see teachers struggling for their basic rights. A very disheartened parent. This email is from um, Christina Duncan. My daughter attends the Snug Harbor Community School. I'm writing today as a mom, community member, lifelong Quincy resident, former QPS teacher, PTO co-chair at SNUG, EDI representative at SNUG to show my support to Quincy educators. My hope was to come to open forum and speak in person, but with our schedule, it just wasn't going to happen. Quincy educators have always held a special place in my heart from kindergarten right to high school. Every educator I had was fully invested in their <coughs> lives. Whether it was Furnace Brook, now Bernazani, Wollaston, Central, or North Quincy High School. Those same values hold true for my daughter at Snug Harbor she has had teachers that care for her and respect her. Now she has only been part of QPS for three years, and so far her favorite teacher was her first grade teacher, who taught her the power of yet. And even a year later, she still infuses that into her learning. I believe in the power of yet as well. Quincy educators don't have a fair contract yet. Our educators don't have parental leave yet. Our educators don't have competitive compensations yet but they can. Let us for a minute think about where we want Quincy education to go. Do we want to have an experienced and diverse staff or do we want all new teachers with very little experience and very little diversity? Where is the equity in what the teachers currently have in their contract? Quincy already has, has already lost so many great teachers because they can't afford to stay. The high rate of turnover only hurts our students, taxpayers, and our city and undermines students' achievement. 
Currently, Quincy has one of the least competitive longevity pay structures in the area. This will eventually force out many teachers. Instead of having experienced teachers, we will become the dumping ground for new teachers, teachers with no experience, teachers who just can't cut it in other districts. The schools will be short-staffed, etc. Schools are in desperate need for more behavioral support <clears throat> specialists. Since when has bullying been a big issue in the low, lower grades? Since when have more kids been struggling with mental health issues? I ask that you consider all this and negotiate a fair contract with our educators. It's time to put our students first. First class cities deserve first class educators. And the last letter is from the citywide um, EDI subcommittee. Uh, it was signed by a number of people, including Heather McDuffis, Shivpreet Singh, Veronica Bertrand, Susan Cullen, Valerie Darty Stewart, Kate Campbell, Matthew Valentius, Anthony and Ginger McGill, Joe Harrisey, Liz Speakman, Christina Duncan, uh, Terry Rodriguez, Maureen and Matthew Medeiros, Nicole Doyle, Catherine Ebbets, Susan Bill, Grace Young J, Amy Sorensen Alouad, Gina Favada, Caitlin Guimaras, Mihaela Russo, Beverly Garcia, Truk Lai, Luciana Triplett, Scott, uh, Scott Alessandro, Conaveri Bolton Valentius, and Elisa Bokulich. Attention school committee members. For the past two years, Quincy Public Schools educators continue to work without a fair and equitable contract. We asked and continue to ask a lot from them and they continuously deliver while exhibiting incredible patience, kindness, and resiliency. Educators rallied and stepped up to the challenge of learning a new way of providing education via online learning. When the pandemic hit in 2020, they were there to support and help students and families during online learning challenges and success during 2020, 2021. They helped support the return to in-person learning in the fall of 2021. They rode the winter wave of spiking COVID cases in Quincy Public Schools in 2021, 2022, and continued their tireless support of providing education to our Quincy Public Schools students and families as we start the 2022-2023 school year, all without an equitable and fair contract. Our educators have been tasked with a lot and continue to be asked of, all the while, asked of a lot all the while they step up to the challenge knowing they are doing so without a fair and equitable contract. This challenge continues even in the face of an evidence of staffing shortages, increased use of substitute teachers, <coughs> unlimited caseloads, and positions going vacant for months. The EDI subcommittee of the citywide PTO see the lack of progress in providing an equitable, fair, and respectful contract for our educators as an unnecessary impact to equity, diversity, inclusion, and inclusion within the QPS system. Quincy Public Schools is challenged at this time with filling vacant positions. One can only ascertain that the lack of a contract within QPS for educators is playing a role in qualified candidates seeking out open opportunities in QPS. This is a direct domino effect on the quality of students, quality of services students are receiving within Quincy Public Schools, as well as a direct impact on accessibility to services many of our vulnerable student populations are required to receive by law through active IEPs and 504 plans. Numerous specialty positions are open across the district, resulting in inadequate service delivery of such services as speech, occupational therapy, special education paraprofessionals, and other positions that support the needs of our students. Lack of caseload caps for such educators has a direct correlation with the quality of services they can provide. Enormous caseloads affect their ability to provide the needed energy, time, and appropriate planning, and because of the staffing shortages, they are often pulled from their primary roles to provide substitute coverage for other teachers. The lack of a caseload cap is important as it has an impact on hiring. Other districts recognize the need to provide a limit to how many students are being served to allow for equitable and appropriate special education and English learner services. Our most vulnerable students deserve better. Our educators deserve better. Our general population students as well are feeling this impact. The consistent use of substitute teachers to fill necessary positions is unprecedented. Subsubjects in the high school setting, for example, have had substitutes for weeks due to vacant positions being open for extended period. This highly affects the education, the quality of education these students receive, not to mention the inequitable education access situation it creates when other students 
receive appropriate instruction from qualified staff, while others are receiving Band-Aid at best coverage from an unqualified substitute whose role is not to be an expert in the subject, but rather provide temporary coverage. That temporary coverage has extended at times to weeks, months, and is thus affecting those students' access to quality education. Educators are leaving positions before the end of the school year, something that was heard of, unheard of in the recent past, but is now a reality in QPS. They are experience, experiencing burnout at unprecedented levels, are overwhelmed and are frustrated. This has played a role in educators making decisions to seek out other opportunities outside of QPS and or moving on from education in general. QPS should be concerned they are losing qualified educators and must be aware of the impact the lack of an agreed upon contract is playing our educators to serve better. QPS has always been proud of the quality of education students receive in the district. Our MCAS scores and other testing tools provide that evidence from elementary through high school. Families seek out the educational reputation that Quincy has worked hard to cultivate and maintain. That legacy is being eroded with the current concern before us. It is impossible to maintain such a, maintain such a quality standard if the quality of education is being directly impacted on a consistent and continuous basis. Educators are critical, as we have always known, but now we recognize on an unprecedented level. They should be given the same respect and acknowledgement as the City of Quincy has shown others in contract negotiations. Our teachers are equally important to the success of Quincy, Massachusetts, as those others. Let's demonstrate that with a fair and equitable contra contract. Our Quincy Public Schools families recognize it. We ask that you do as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Owens. Do you need to take a break? <laughs> I'm okay. Okay, it's time for item three, superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do um, want to take this time to address some of the comments uh, that were made tonight, and I know that members may have um, some questions with regard to uh, negotiations, but I, I do want to say that um, during the course of negotiations, and we've been in negotiations since June, this committee uh, and its representatives on the negotiating team have been bargaining in good faith. And we have bargained for 10 full sessions. We have listened to all of the proposals that the QEA put forward, and we put forward our own proposals. Um, we have agreed, just so you know, um, in ground rules to limit our executive session discussions, which is our confidential negotiation sessions, to within the bargaining sessions, and that we would limit our commentary on um, what's happening in those sessions uh, so that we would not necessarily uh, get into a, a battle, a public battle, which would um, devolve into rather a, a negotiation session that would be lacking in respect. Our goal is to continue to negotiate in good faith and to do so respectfully and not to get into public commentary, which by the way, I have to say, a lot of the commentary that you heard tonight is just not true, flatly false. We have some of the lowest class sizes in the state. We have always been proud of our class sizes. The elementary class sizes, are at or below 20, which is incredible. We, the SLT, myself and the SLT, work day in and day night, day in and in, uh, in late into the night to make sure that our class sizes are reasonable, that our case loads are effective for our students. Would we prefer to have some increases in areas? Yes, but when we do, we come to this body, we ask for additional funding, and what does this body do? This body gives us that additional funding. It gives us that support. It has done so year in and year out. I'm a member of the Urban Superintendents Group, and I have to say Quincy is the envy of many of these groups because of its class size. This body, as you see, in school committee meetings throughout the year, always focus on class size. We present regularly on class size. We work with the union to address classes that may um, uh, be uh, reaching limits. And we, we in, undertake 
a number of uh, ways to resolve those high class sizes. That could be asking this committee for additional funding and staffing, which happens upon our request. It may be asking teachers to take on an additional class, and we pay them for that. And we do that through negotiations with the, M with the uh, QEA through an MOA. I'll try and refrain from engaging in direct commentary on the negotiations that are happening because we, in good faith, said we would not take it publicly, but we would work respectfully and honestly in executive session so that we wouldn't have what we're having right now, which is hearsay, unsubstantiated allegations, and false allegations. This district has parental leave. This district, for instance, has unlimited use of sick time for family members who are sick. We require a doctor's note, but if a doctor's note is provided, the entire accrued sick leave of an educator can be used to care for a family member. A total falsehood that you heard tonight. That's just one example. We love our educators. We support our educators. And we're bargaining in good faith to reach an agreement. There's no one here on this committee that wants to see an agreement as quick as possible. We want to see that because we want to get back to educating our kids without the disruption of contentious negotiations. It's our goal to continue those negotiations. We will continue those negotiations. As you know, we have another uh, session. Uh, we had a session scheduled for November 28th that was continued at the request of the union. We agreed to that. We have a meeting now on December 21st. And we will continue in good faith to make progress in negotiations. That is our goal. But again, the reason why we don't comment publicly on negotiations is to avoid what just happened here tonight, which is allegations and hearsay that is not substantiated in many cases. And I won't go through all of them. This committee may have questions about them. I'll be happy to answer them. But we have been working tirelessly to resolve a contract and to do it respectfully and honestly and without getting into and dragging the process into um, what, we're, what, what unfortunately we're getting to now, which is unsubstantiated allegations and, and, and downright untruths about where this district stands and where we want to go with a fair contract. I would just recommend to you Ask for the QEA contract yourself. Look at the contract. See what benefits are in there. There's allegations here that benefits that are clearly within the contract aren't in there. They are. And again, we're making strides to improve some of the areas in which the union has requested. We've moved and moved significantly on their requests. And again, I won't get into details because we've agreed to keep that in executive session. But just for instance, some things that other communities don't have that are, that are, you know, Quincy is the envy of those communities is the, our healthcare system. That's just one example in addition to our class size. And I, I can tell you our special education program in Quincy, I would say that there, I, there, was, there, there would be very few communities you could compare that has a special education program in this community that supports our kids the way we support our kids. Thanks to the work of Aaron Perkins and Julie Graham and all of the members of the SLT, we are extremely proud of the special education program here in Quincy. If you listen to these open forum comments, you would think that we, we don't care about kids, particularly special education kids. It's the absolute opposite. Our focus is kids, students particularly students with disabilities, so that we can make their life as best as possible and to make their education as fulfilling as possible. That's what we do. That's what we exist for. And to hear otherwise is um, really, really disappointing that we're at this point where these allegations are being made totally unsubstantiated, totally false. Is there areas that we can improve in? Yeah, absolutely, every district can. Have we just gone through two years of COVID that has taken a significant toll on our staff and our students and our families? Absolutely. Have we worked through it? Yes. Do we have work to do and continue to do? Absolutely. That's our hope that we can do that with the union, do it respectfully, honestly, 
and to make as much progress and as quick as possible in the next session to reach an agreement so we don't start tearing the community apart. That's the last thing this body wants, certainly the last thing I want, certainly the last thing the SLT wants. We want a fair contract, and I know the community wants a fair contract, and I hope the teachers, and I know the teachers, all the vast majority of the teachers want a fair contract. We will get there, but we just ask for patience. We ask for respect. We ask for the ground rules to be followed, and we ask for honesty. But to bring allegations in open forum that are just absolutely not true, allegations that make it look like Quincy does not have the student's best interest at heart is just totally unfortunate, unfounded, um, and uh, I hope we don't see it again. Um, but in conclusion, we are here to bargain in good faith. <coughs> this body has done that from the very beginning. It's committed to doing that moving forward. And I, I hope we can reach a resolution uh, on December 21st. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you for coming. Thank you for expressing your thoughts. We have heard you. We've heard you from the beginning. We've heard the teachers. And we are working towards a fair and equitable contract for everyone. So thank you. Mayor Koch, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to make a few comments, and they might have a couple of questions for the superintendent uh, as well. First of all, uh, we live in Quincy, which is land of Adams. John and Abigail Adams were very strong in opinions. We live in a democratic republic where people are entitled to their opinions, and I think that's just awesome. I always listen, and I appreciate the input we had tonight. The other thing that John Adams once said is that facts are stubborn things, that we're not necessarily entitled to the facts, our own facts. So I'm, I'm pleased that you pointed out some of those issues because it is, it is a little disheartening to have a process in place and then information uh, gets leaked out that isn't even accurate. I, I just think that's unfair. Uh, I also don't like to see comparisons pitting a department against another department. You know, as, as mayor, I put the budget together each year and, and work with this body on the school budget, work with the city council, the city side budget. Every city department has a mission. Our library department, for example, is a great supporter of our school system. Our park department takes care of the grounds of our schools. When we separated that out years ago, we didn't take any money out with it. A few years back, we created a public buildings department, which has resulted in so much more work being done for our schools, and we didn't take a nickel out of the budget to do that. Each and every year, we've increased the school budget pretty healthily. I, you know, some of the comments on, on the COVID stuff, the first priority, and, and by the way, um, as we all know, that was extremely difficult. Nobody knew what was coming. Everybody's working very hard to do the best they very could. Um, and we immediately began to work on our buildings. We went through every building, HVAC, air exchange systems, you name it. We spent millions of dollars upgrading our buildings to make them safe for our kids. We invested in technology in the millions of dollars with Chromebooks and had to boost the technology into the buildings that would support those things. And you know, the, the word respect uh, has been thrown out a lot too. And, and, and I hope in my 35 years in public life, I've always given everyone their due respect. And I, I just want to say during that time period, I made a decision across the city not to lay anybody off. Again, we didn't know what was coming. Revenues were going to be way off. I made a decision. We're not laying anybody off. So everybody got a paycheck, whether it worked or not, during that time period. We had DPW guys going into people's homes, cleaning out backups and source systems during that time, and they had no idea if that would have an effect on their health. Everybody did the best they possibly could. And when we came back to the buildings, every accommodation that was requested by a teacher was taken care of. Every single one. That, to me, is respect. Rightfully so. So I, you know, I, I hope we can get there. Um, I, I've said that I always treat everybody equally for my position. Salary, I not, would not accept anything less than anybody else got with teachers, uh, by any means. Um, and and the, the lead off in one of those letters was for the past two years. The contract was up in September just a few months ago. 
I've got, I've got negotiating still going on the city side. I just signed contracts this week to go back to July 1st. That's typical in the process. And then the pay goes retroactive to that time. This isn't unusual. I do question some of the, some of the motives and some of the uh, perhaps influence the MTA has over uh, the QEA. That troubles me a little bit. When we're into one session or two sessions and the membership are wearing shirts in June, different colored shirts, to send a message, what's the message? Contracts into September. You know, that stuff troubles me, but people are entitled uh, to their, certainly their opinions, but not to the facts. Um, so it, at this point, uh, I'd open it up. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, I think you clarified most of uh, what I had, except um, longevity. He didn't, he, you did mention the, the health insurance. We have a very good health insurance plan for our city employees. And the ratio of pay is, is contributions is pretty healthy as well. Um, but I know that longevity has been kicked around. We have two different types of longevity. Somebody mentioned our senior teachers uh, deserve more. I think we have a, I forget the plan. It used to be the Brookline plan. I think it was called the Lexington plan or something. And yeah, we have a longevity A and a longevity B. Just for the public B. to know some of these facts. Yeah. Okay, we have a longevity A and a longevity B. The longevity B allows for, uh, and Allison, correct me if I'm wrong, but what, well, Jim? Uh, Jim, would you like to, can you review what the two longevities are just so what we have the exact numbers? Um, sure. Uh, longevity A is the typical uh, for the contract that it goes on annually. Uh, longevity B, which was the old Lexington plan, uh, allows for a teacher in the final three years uh, to increase their longevity to $15,500 over those three years. So it's $5,000, $5,000, and $5,500. So there is a, a, an opportunity to obtain more longevity payments uh, through, longevity, uh, through the Lexington plan or longevity B in our contract. And for the public's knowledge, there are also several steps for teachers uh, as they go through and gain additional education. Right. Separate from the salary schedule, there are steps. You're correct. There are um, uh, between uh, 10 and 11 steps, uh, depending upon uh, their education. And um, as their education uh, credits rise, it starts out at a level four and ends at a level, level seven. Uh, the majority of our teachers right now are on levels, well, not the majority, but the uh, plurality of our teachers are on level six and six and a half. Uh, which is significantly higher pay than uh, when they come in at level four as a bachelor's degree. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Okay. I'll yield the floor. Members of the committee, questions? Mrs. Cahill. I don't have a question, but I have um, a comment. Um, I, I, you know, I appreciate all the parents that come and stand in solidarity with the teachers um, and, and, you know, the, the students that we teach in the system. But, you know, as school committee members, we also are here to advocate for teachers and for the, and the, the students in the system as well. Um, I couldn't be more proud of the work that the teachers do in the classroom every day. And um, the inference that as we as a school committee take them for granted is upsetting to me. And I'm concerned with the inaccurate information that is being shared about contract negotiations on social media and in the community. And as a school committee member, the community should know that with respect to the bargaining process, we cannot comment on the specifics, and we shouldn't comment on the specifics, and neither should the QEA. I hope the Quincy Public School Committee and parents know that we do value the teachers in our system, the academic and social emotional initiatives that we offer, and it is our hope that we come to a fair contract resolution through a thoughtful and good faith negotiation process a process that is based on the truth and not false, inaccurate information that is being distributed to the public. You know, and that's our goal. So we hope that we can get there and get, get there in a fair and respectful manner. Thank you. Anybody else? Mrs. Lebo. I you know, just want to reiterate what, what my colleague said. I, I can't be more pleased are proud of the Quincy educators uh, and the work that they do with our kids every single day, with my own children and my grandchildren in the schools now. Um, but I, I heard a word from, I think it was from uh, Liz Speakman about compromise and mutual respect. And I, I think that we have been trying to do that and we have been trying to compromise and um, it doesn't feel like 
anything's coming back to us to compromise with. So it's, um, it's a little discouraging to hear people saying that we're not compromising and we don't have any, we don't have any respect for our teachers when we can't, as Ms. Cahill said, we can't come out and publicly say what's in the negotiations. It's confidential information. And I don't know if, if the MTA wants to open that up and make it not confidential. Uh, I don't know, but they, they don't, they, it's, it's, we're, we're left in a very, very difficult position because we don't want to go against the rules of negotiations. So we can't, we can't say, we can't respond to individual things like that. We just can't do it. So I'm, I'm just disappointed that, um, that we're left in this position. Thank you. Mr. Bagoli? Yeah, just a couple of comments. Um, if you look at this particular school committee, I think you'll find it unique in that um, there were a lot of former educators on the committee. And for people uh, to say that we are not concerned about teachers uh, is very upsetting. I spent 34 years in the school system. Um, and I spent, spent another 10 years on the school committee. So I care about education in the system. And uh, the way the negotiate, I was, I was also a QBA rep for 10 years. And the way the negotiations have gone, this go around is like nothing I've ever seen before in this city. And I'm not, I don't know where it's coming from. Uh, the mayor alluded to the MTA, and I think um, they're part of the problem. They're not part of the solution. So um, I just, uh, I just, it, I can see, I, I hope you see I, I'm upset. Anybody else? I just have a, I, I'm anxious to get answers to some of the comments that were made and um, I'm hoping this is appropriate, but leaving trend, is there a leaving trend amongst our staff? Yeah, that- Superintendent. And, and we, we, will give you, we will get you the retention numbers, but um, year in and year out, we do not have a leaving trend here in Quincy. Absolutely not. And do we have applicants applying for positions? Absolutely. We just had an OT a posting where we have selected a successful candidate and we had several others who were willing to come to Quincy who want to provide just for instance OT services. Um, the allegation that we have open positions, absolutely not true. Could we use more paras? Yes. Do we have educational positions open within the district? No, we have one. And the same position is opened in five other surrounding districts because of its high need. That's information technology in the CVTE school. All other positions are filled. Again, another misconception. Do we need more subs? Yes. Do we need more paraprofessionals? Yes. We've been saying that since the beginning of the school year and before. But to say that we don't fill educa uh, professional educator positions, absolutely not true. We have one open, and again, that position is also open in five surrounding towns because of the the lack of qualifications for that position. How are we dealing with that? We're dealing with that through working with our partners, Granite Telecommunication. They're sending over people skilled in information technology to give our students uh, additional boost in that area, to provide students with internships in that area if they want, so that they can get hands-on education with information technology in lieu of a full-time educate a license in that area. We're not leaving our students uh, behind, in, even in that one area that's still opened. We will continue to obviously look to find a licensed professional for that spot. In the meantime, we will make sure that our students are progressing in that area. But all other professional educator positions are absolutely filled within this district. It sounds as if we have substitutes covering all over the city. I I don't understand where that comment is coming from. There are no substitutes uh, other than a substitute in that information technology class. Obviously, we have subs covering illnesses and um, that sort of thing. Uh, but with regard to full-time professional staff, 
substitutes are not covering um, the only position is the one that I just mentioned. So totally not true. I'm also concerned about the comments made about our kids um, not receiving services correctly, especially uh, being out of compliance comments, um, uh, yeah, comments about um, yeah. legal issues when it comes to number of children in classes uh, that need services. These are all coming our way via letters yeah. that aren't true. And I don't know where the people are getting the information, but go ahead. A as answer. everyone knows, under the leadership of Aaron Perkins as the former special education director and under the leadership of Julie Graham, there is no better district, in my opinion, uh, with regard to the advocacy of special education students. Uh, we would not allow students to not receive the services that they are required. Absolutely not. Not true. Not true. Um, I think there was an allegation with regard to uh, occupational therapy. Uh, yes, a staff member did leave. We posted it. We had several candidates that wanted to come to Quincy, and we just hired an exceptional candidate to fill that spot. Just an example of the many people who want to come and work in Quincy because of, the, uh, the, because of Quincy's special education reputation. It's an excellent reputation, and we've built it over the years. Again, thanks to Mrs. Perkins and Ms. Graham. So, so to hear those type of allegations is really disappointing and totally untrue, unsubstantiated, and it shouldn't happen. Every, again, I, I, I'm, on the, I'm on the urban superintendents group. The other superintendents from the other urban superintendents group, they know how well we do here in Quincy. They call us and ask us how we do it here in Quincy. Mrs. Perkins, expert in special education, and our assistant superintendent, and Julie Graham, her successor. We couldn't ask for a better team and better advocates for our students. The, but I can't forget the committee here, the school committee. If we ask for additional staffing, they, they fund it, the mayor. Without question, we need something for kids, they fund it. They support the special education programs in this city, the general education programs in the city and to here. Otherwise, it's very disappointing. Thank you. Mayor Koch? Yeah, just one, one more item that I thought needed to be covered. Um, one is that uh, the, the throwaway line about the public safety headquarters. Uh, when I took office, one of the biggest complaints I heard from our staff in the schools and teachers was the condition of the buildings. My first 10 years, um, was about the school buildings. We have built three new buildings. We're in the process of building another new one. We're in the process of building a, a new learning center for our special needs kids. We've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on our buildings. Repairs, rehabilitations, new buildings. All that debt service, that's additional cost that's not in the school budget. So um, I didn't want to leave that out because that building on Old Colony Ave is going to be delivering tremendous service to our families in the city who have some challenges. And, and, uh, and some of that COVID money has gone to that. So um, I hope that perhaps maybe the QEA could ask the MTA to step out of the room and maybe we can get this thing solved because I, I've seen the MTA operate. These are my personal opinions around the state for many years. They're a very, very political organization. Uh, I was just reading a, a note that went out to, to members about uh, you can take a session on how to strike. I mean, I, I think they're more divisive than they are being helpful to come to a, a resolution here. So uh, I'm committed to getting it done. I know my colleagues are committed to get it done. So let's get it done. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, Superintendent, let's get to uh, item A, QPS student recognitions, holiday poster concert winners. Thank you, and good evening, everyone, again. hope everyone is doing well. Uh, first is IQPS student recognitions. Congratulations to the winners of the annual Christmas poster contest sponsored by Quincy Access Television. The following Quincy Public Schools receive first, second, or third place in their grade level, grade level categories, and also the following students. Rayanj Kadri, grade three, Montclair. Lexine Zhu, grade two, Beechwood No Elementary School. Jocelyn Wu, grade five, Beechwood No Elementary School. Anna Maloney, grade five, Southwest Middle School. 
These students were invited to ride in the Christmas parade and the winning posters are on display in the windows of the Quincy Sun throughout the holiday season. In addition, there were a number of students who received honorable mention and they are as follows. Jack Bly, grade three, Squantum Elementary School. Nina Lynn, grade one, Beecher Knoll Elementary School. Alexander Lee, grade three, Lincoln Hancock Community School. Conan, Conan Eng, grade four, Lincoln Hancock Community School. Jack Myers, grade four, Bernazani Elementary School, and Eason Chen, grade five, Atherton Howe Elementary School. Congratulations to these schools and their students. They, they make us very proud. Next is QPS staff recognition. I'm very happy to report at DEZ's invitation, Senior Director of Student Support Services, Mara Papel, recently presented to districts across Massachusetts on promising practices for dropout prevention and re-engagement. Quincy Public Schools initiatives in this area were funded in part by the social, emotional, and mental health wellness grant <coughs> monies provided for last school year and continued into this year. In the 15 years that DZ has published this data, Quincy Public Schools has had the second lowest dropout rate of the 15 largest school districts in Massachusetts, only behind the Newton Public Schools each year, and has consistently been below the state average. So congratulations to Senior Director Mara Papil and thank you for representing the Quincy Public Schools uh, at that uh, statewide event. Thank you. Next is the Middle School Robotics Program update. The first event of the season is a qualifying event being held at Revere High School on Saturday, December 10th. Quincy Public Schools will be re represented by teams from Atlantic Middle School and Central Middle School, two teams each from each school, and Point Webster teams um, and Point Web. So teams from Broad Meadows and Southwest are just getting up and running and will enter their first competitions in the new year. So best of luck to those robotics teams. Uh, next is the upcoming QPS uh, in City of Quincy events. The Quincy Public Schools winter concert schedule was shared with you at your places uh, in there in your packet. The calendar invitations have also been sent to you via email so you can plan to attend events as your schedule permits. Uh, again, these um, winter concerts uh, have proven in the past to be very impressive. We've seen a couple already. Certainly, tis the season at uh, Quincy High School uh, was um, and it was a great, great event for our students and families. So I encourage you to attend if your schedule permits. North Quincy High School drama is presenting the importance of being earnest on Friday, December 9th and Saturday, December 10th at 7 p.m. in the Chrism Auditorium at North Quincy High School. Those students have been very hard at work uh, in preparing for that play, and obviously I wish them the best of luck. Uh, they're going to be doing, they'll do great. Uh, the Quincy Parent Advisory Council to Special Education is once again hosting the annual gingerbread decorating events in the Quincy High School cafeteria on Friday, December 9th at 6, 6 p.m. for students in kindergarten through grades 5 and Saturday, December 10th at 11 a.m. for students in grades six and up. It's 6 p.m., yep, sorry. Thank you. Okay. It is 6 p.m. for students in kindergarten through grade five and Saturday, December 10th at 11 a.m. Uh, for students in grades six and up. Families <coughs> are requested to register at the following um, email address, QPAC. Dot Quincy at gmail.com. That's Q P A C dot Quincy, Q U I N C Y at gmail.com. Uh, the Quincy High School girls basketball team is hosting a holiday shopping event with local vendors and artisans on Sunday, December 11th from noon uh, to 4 p.m. in the school cafeteria. With that, that ends my superintendent's report. Thank you, superintendent. Questions, comments? Okay, moving on to old business. Policy 9.7.12, service animals. This is up for a vote. Mr. Bergoli. Yeah, well, it's been uh, approved, and um, we're going to vote tonight to uh, put this in our policy book. Any, uh, any other questions on it? Questions of the committee? No. Take a motion. Motion to uh, approve. Motion to Mr. Bergoli, seconded by Mrs. Lebo. We approve. We need a vote? Yes. And a roll call. Mr. Bergoli? Yes. Mrs. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gatro? Yes. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mrs. Santoro? Yes. And Maya Cope? Yes. Item B, naming Point Webster Middle School field for Private John Mariano. This is up for a vote. Mr. Bergoli. Again, that's we have approved this. And uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to go down and see the, uh, the, the field, it's, it's unbelievable, spectacular. 
uh, kudos to uh, the mayor for putting this together. And um, again, uh, need a motion here to uh, approve. I'll make a motion, and on the motion, if I, if I might, that uh, that was paid for with state monies uh, from State Representative and Speaker of the House, Ron Mariano. So we should give him his due. Motion of the mayor, seconded by Mrs. Hubley. Superintendent, please call the roll. Mr. Bagoli? Yes. Mrs. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gatro? Yes. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mrs. Santoro? Yes. And Mayor Coke? Yes. Item C, establishing a policy section 9.15. Student electronic device policy. This is up for a discussion. Uh, it is eligible for a vote on January 11th. Mr. Brigoli? Yeah, again, we uh, uh, <clears throat> talked about this in subcommittee um, on November 30th, and um, we had a very good discussion and a lot of good questions. Uh, is there any further discussion this evening on this uh, particular policy? Anybody on the committee? No. Seeing none. We're all set. All right. Thank you. New business. Technology planning and training program improvement plan. Um, Quinty Public Schools website. Social media update. Mr. Segala, Mr. Cavallo, Mr. Mr. Pacho, and Mrs. Powers. Ms. Powers to present. Welcome. Thank you, Vice Chair Santoro, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this evening to share and highlight our technology planning and training team's 2022-23 program improvement plan. Joining me tonight are Rob Cavallo, IT Systems Administrator, Daniel Pacho, IT Data Coordinator, and Kelly Powers, our Digital Communications and Web Accessibility Specialist. These three administrators are not only committed, to, committed and dedicated to Quincy Public Schools, but they're also knowledgeable talented and unique in their own IT ways. And we're very fortunate to have them here at Connington. We hope you had an opportunity to review our, our PIP this evening. So, so to that, and in the spirit of time, uh, the team members will provide a brief technology plan update. And these updates are certainly aligned to our goals, our action steps, as well as our sources of evidence. Mr. Pacho will share aspects of Quincy's Aspen functionality and user support. He'll overview the planning and preparation of our 2023-24 program of studies, scheduling and grading process, as well as highlight state and federal data reporting procedures. Mr. Mr. Cavallo will share the district's 2022-23 technology plan priorities, including desktop computer replacements, professional staff laptops, Chromebooks, and installation of 95 interactive short throw projectors. Bob will also highlight our educational software expenditures and our current technology inventory. Ms. Powers will, con will conclude by sharing the progress of our home, home to school communications. In particular, Kelly will highlight our QPS website and social media efforts. Members of the school committee, we're appreciative of your leadership and your investment in this new position, the digital communications and web accessibility specialists. We're proud of the continued progress made thus far. More importantly, not only promoting and sharing the extraordinary daily events initiatives, and there are many, as you well know, but celebrating student and staff achievements, of which is a source of pride and satisfaction for each of us, and including members of the SLT, our principals, and others. Again, thank you, and we'll begin with Mr. Pacho. Hello, good evening. Um, so our role at, as the IT data um, and operations team uh, encompasses, uh, as a quick overview, uh, encompasses three key major categories. Um, supports Quincy Public Schools, operations via Aspen functionality and user support, scheduling and grading, uh, and uh, state and federal data reporting. First, um, with Aspen functionality and user support, our role is to support Aspen users' interactions with various functionalities within Aspen. As you may already know, Aspen is a very powerful um, student information tool. Our schools use it daily uh, for tasks such as med but not limited to attendance, scheduling, grading, special education, record keeping, some data analysis, and students use it to check their grades, schedules, and assignment deadlines. With a wide array of features and functionalities, Aspen support could range from tier one items such as resetting passwords, quick navigation support, to a tier three level support, which is troubleshooting special education procedures and workflows, and other back-end school reports. Our goal is to minimize 
any friction between users and their interaction with Aspen. As of recently, we've created an internal support page for teachers that contains resources, uh, for example, such as uh, how to use Aspen Gradebook for assignments and homeworks. Second, scheduling and grading. With collaboration from principals, secretaries, guidance teams, our office our office helps our schools build their schedules to completeness for, and for accuracy. Different grade levels present different levels of complexity. Our high schools are most complex. It requires a little bit of additional assistance. Our team helps the schools produce the programs of studies, program of studies and pathways. And we help prepare them for teacher recommendations and student online course requesting later this year. The high school program of, program of studies and pathways documents are currently in progress and will be made available in February. The high school student online course selection is scheduled for March 2023. With grading, we work with principals to make sure that our teachers are able to enter and post grades for their students in a timely manner. Our office also publishes the report cards in Aspen after the grade reporting periods end. Lastly, state and federal reporting. Our team is tasked with collecting and submitting data for state and federal reporting. We work together with the principals, secretaries, other school and district administrators to obtain accurate information. The data collection and reporting component consists of SIMS, which is our student level data reporting. This includes their demographic information, such as gender, grade level, and school enrollment. EPIMS, which is our educator level data reporting. This includes students, uh, teachers' demographic data, work assignments, and district positions. SCS, this is our student course level. Uh, student schedule courses. This is the student's schedules and transcripts. Courses completed with QPS. SSDR, this is school safety and discipline report. This is the conduct and discipline data obtained from our schools. Finally, CRDC. Civil Rights Data Collection, <coughs> which is a federal data reporting. Much of the data is disaggregated by race, ethnicity, gender, limited English proficiency, and disability. The state reporting items happens two to three times a year, and with CRDC, that occurs every two years. Thank you for your time. Good evening. I'm here to highlight a few of the uh, appendix items at the back of the packet. The first one I want to share with you tonight is the yellow sheet. Uh, this is the 2022-2023 technology plan priorities. Working with our superintendent's leadership team, principals, uh, we were able to identify technology needs at the school buildings. The chart in front of you gives you a breakdown by school and shows you that we purchased 95 interactive projectors and 102 desktop classroom computers. These 95 interactive projectors allowed us to install the remaining classrooms that didn't have any mounted projectors equipped with them. Uh, we were also able to assist in replacing broken projectors that were in some of these classrooms. We just received these projectors as of last week. An installation started at North Quincy High School. We were able to install 26 projectors that finished the installation yesterday. Um, today, they began installation at Atlantic Middle School, and then from there, they'll continue on to the next schools after that. The purchasing of the 102 desktop computers helped replace eight plus year old computers. These computers were in academic programs and academic support classrooms. We were able to make these purchases using our instructional technology line and funds from ESSER. The next uh, sheet is the blue one. This is our 2022-2023 uh, acquisition of instructional budget. Oh, I'm sorry, instructional technology budget. Here you'll see that we used portions of these funds towards the 102 desktop computers, as well as purchasing 25 staff laptops for new professional staff. Our total expenditures did exceed the budget of 97,000 by about $40,000, which we ended up using the ESSER funds to cover the difference. The next sheet moving on is the green sheet. This is our 2022-2023 educational software budget. On this chart, we list out the categories, the software vendors, and a brief description of what the purchase was used for. Uh, the majority of these expenses are annual licensing, <coughs> maintenance fees, and uh, renewals of the software packages. 
As you can see, our total expenditures did exceed our budget by 162,000. We were able to use ESSER funds for the difference for this year. All of the software uh, maintenance fees have increased over the last year. Um, and we also continue to use software that was purchased during the pandemic, such as Google Workspace, Zoom, and a few others. Um, during that time, we used the CARES funding to purchase these. Um, but this year, we still wanted to use these softwares. And we were able to use ESSER funds to continue to purchase these software. The last sheet I'm going to go over is the pink one. This is our technology overview for our PDQ inventory system. On this sheet, the chart gives you a breakdown of each school building listed and the total breakdown of desktop computers by age. It also gives, shows the staff laptops and student Chromebooks. As you can see, the total number of devices that we have in our district is 10,453. This includes student and staff devices across the district. The majority of this number are, is made up of student Chromebooks at 7,590. And then we also have 1,800 staff laptops. These purchases were made uh, within the last couple of years using CARES funding uh, provided through the pandemic. We also have 1,845 desktop computers, which consist of classroom computers and student labs. Uh, next, Ms. Kelly Powers will present on the Quincy Public Schools website and social media. Thank you, Bob, and thank you everyone for your time tonight. I am delighted to be here and to share how I've been spending my first few months here in Quincy. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of background. Um, I most recently came from the Weymouth Central Office. I was supporting the Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Operations and supporting their website. Before that, I worked for the Appalachian Mountain Club, managing their digital presence, overseeing their website and web applications, their email marketing program, excuse me, and supporting their social media efforts. I am a parent of three school-aged children at Weymouth. Um, this year, I have one at each level, um, primary, middle, and high school. And I volunteered as both a PTO chair and a communications chair in the schools. I share all this to say I identify with your audience. Um, this is all very familiar territory for me. How have I spent, been spending my first three months? First and foremost, I've prioritized visiting the school buildings to get to know the district. I've been meeting with principals and program directors, touring buildings, and attending events. I've also been gathering data, digging into our tools to assess website traffic and accessibility, social media, and getting to know our users' behavior. All of this helps inform my decisions and my goals moving forward. I am also devoting a lot of time to social media, managing the district's presence on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, which is new this year for the district. I was fortunate to inherit a really robust social media program from Laura Owens, who did a wonderful job building and managing our online communities. I am now working on a very intentional approach to content and messaging and have been getting to know our audiences and understanding what content is appropriate for each platform. And last but certainly not least, I've been updating the school and district websites. Managing 20 websites is no small task, but it's work I love. Um, I've been resolving accessibility issues, posting updates, and just generally making improvements as I go. Knowing how eager everyone was for updates, I created a checklist this fall to address the website tasks I felt would allow us to make quick progress. So working school by school, I've been working with the principals to address these items. Revitalizing the news feeds and the calendars so that parents can easily access this information online. This includes the school newsletters. We are updating photography, one of the easiest ways to freshen up a website. I have been working with each school to ensure the staff directories are accurate and informative so that parents can easily identify and contact staff. And I've been working through general housekeeping, fixing broken links, accessibility issues, and ensuring content is refreshed and accurate for the school year. And I'm always tracking the analytics. What are people looking for and how can we improve? This next slide shows a report that's also in the technology PIP appendices. Um, this report references those tasks described on the previous slide and is what I've been using to track progress on each of these tasks by school. The report is current through the early part of last week, so there have been a few updates since then. I want to explain that there has been no particular order in how I've approached the schools, and the boxes that are still in check are 100% based on my capacity and my schedule. I've been meeting with about two schools a week since I started in September. 
Um, I don't want any of this to reflect poorly on our principals who are doing a wonderful job. I'm meeting with Parker on Friday um, and visiting Central early next week. So you'll see quick progress there um, after next week. You can still see we have a lot of work to do, but I'm thrilled with how much progress we've made so far. This next slide is just another quick look at the progress. Uh, meetings, updating the staff directories and photography updates have been very straightforward. Current news and site updates are taking a little bit longer just due to varying approaches by the schools um, in terms of formats and frequency of their updates, but I'll continue to work through that in the next few months. Looking ahead with our websites, um, a few of my journal ideas for moving forward. Um, I will always take any opportunity to build out content. Um, right off the bat, I see opportunities to build out curriculum, academic and extracurricular, extracurricular program information to showcase our schools. Newsletters are a pet project of mine with a few other departments, including DEI and EL. We are all hoping to standardize the digital newsletters on a single platform that is easily integrated with our websites and is translatable and accessible. We will continue to liven up our photography, um, and we are using some st stock photography right now, but we will be building our QPS photo library to showcase the district through authentic and original imagery. Calendar is very important to me. I am um, part of a very busy family and know the value of a good calendar. Um, I'll be taking a long look at our website calendars and how to optimize them over time for Quincy families. And finally, our district users for the websites, our principals, and some of our program directors were last trained in this in February 2020. They've kind of had their hands full since then. Um, so I'll be updating our training materials and making another pass through the schools to retrain users um, this winter. Looking at our social media, um, I mentioned this has been a really intentional approach. I have been cultivating our digital presence as a persona. So we as a district, QPS, is earnest and transparent. I want families to know us as a trustworthy source of information. We are eager to celebrate achievements. I like to say the day I started this job, I became Quincy's biggest cheerleader. We are engaged with the Quincy community, um, continuing Laura's precedent by liking and sharing community news and highlighting our community partners. And finally, of course, um, committed to inclusion and accessibility in everything we do. I created this slide to talk about my social media goals, but these are really my guiding principles for everything I do. Um, at the highest level, content distribution is the core. I'm supporting the superintendent's office and priority messaging for the district. This, of course, trickles down to the school level where I'm communicating events and opportunities at the buildings. Acquisition is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, as you all know, we live in an age of choice. We do not necessarily have a captive audience right now, and public schools do need to market themselves. Websites and social media are often the first impressions family have with a school when they move into town or research their options. So I'm always thinking about how we reach those families who are considering where to send their children, whether it's young families with pre-K students or those who are considering private options. I am committed to showcasing all that we offer and the opportunities available to each individual student. I want everyone to know that our schools are the premier educational choice for Quincy families and their students. Retention is very similar. I'm using these tools to engage with current families, to deepen connections, build affinity and community, and cultivate ambassadors for the district. Word of mouth is so important, and I think these connections with our current families really help. And on a tactical note, I am a career website manager, so everything I do is going to drive traffic back to our websites. This is a quick look at some recent popular posts on Facebook. I'm not sure how many of you have been following this directly, so I just wanted to show off some of the content that has resonated with our audience. We had a great post um, of the Quincy High Culinary Kitchen just before Thanksgiving as the students were making their pies and um, advertising the pie sale. Um, in the middle is the Bernazani second grade contraction surgeons. The kids were in their scrubs creating contractions from larger words that they were given. And finally, um, I attended the new educator mentoring event at Central in early November where our staff um, were at work. And again, that got, got um, great traction. And finally, I just wanted to share a few things that we were able to accomplish in short order this fall that I feel really good about. From September to October, we did see a 156% increase in our reach on Facebook. That's how many people are seeing our posts. So this little extra time and attention is, is paying off. We've made some quick aesthetic updates on the district site, and I'm working on that by department, where we're improving the use of our real estate um, content organization and making it 
just more compelling and engaging. <coughs> and finally, I mentioned the calendars earlier. We revived a district calendar on the website um, with holidays, school committee meetings, and other key district events, and that's being fed out to all school websites. To wrap up, I just wanted to say thank you for creating this role. I am thrilled that Quincy saw the importance of this work. I've really enjoyed these first few months, and I look forward to more progress with all of you. With that, I am happy to open up uh, questions for anyone here at the table. Mr. Gutro. Thank you. Um, super presentation. Um, so Keith, a um, couple of things. Looks like you have an all-star team now. Um, I'm a big fan of the use of technology and, and uh, digital media out there in a big way. So I, uh, let me just say three quick things about each presentation. So Bob has always been phenomenal, uh, accessible, responsive, amazing. Um, we had a presentation over the course of the last two months from all of the principals on their school improvement plans, and oftentimes it's facilities, sometimes it's technology. We'll probably take that up next year. You know, maybe between now and then you can look at some of the school improvement plans, look at the technology needs, and, and whether we have you back in person to talk it through or you just do a summary of where those things are going, that would be, I think, useful for, the, for this one. For Dan, you, you were speaking my language with Aspen, um, which I, I love that. So could you just, um, and, and I might have to, I, I, I would love your talking points that you used uh, so that I could look at it because there might be things that I want to put in committee and have you back and do a deeper dive. But could you just walk through what you said about the daily use of Aspen in the schools right now? Sure. I, I think you mentioned like five or six points. Yeah, yeah. So for as, as far as daily, so. You know, or, or routine. Routine. So morning is uh, obviously our daily attendance, uh, making making sure that students are accounted for. They are, you know, and and um, we make the proper communication out yep. uh, if they are absent, right? Um, great, so class, and then another thing is class period attendance, you know, big thing right now is definitely attendance, especially during the pandemic. Uh, we wanna make sure that the students are in there. So we got attendance, we have uh, our grading. So as of yesterday, uh, we finished our, finished and published our elementary school grading. Uh, middle schools are finishing uh, today and tomorrow is going to be our cleanup, and then that's going to be published uh, on Friday. Um, what were the other? There were like five five elements you said. So yeah, so students use it for checking their schedules. Schedules, yep. Um, they can go in there and, and check their assignments and whenever they're due for uh, deadlines. Yep. Um, students can go in there and check their grades as well as parents with Parent Portal can also go in there and, and check their grades. Yep. Um, they can also look at their transcripts uh, uh, from uh, previous years and, and download report cards and, su and such. And, and do you do uh, analytics based on use? You know, I, what, what, what uh, you don't have to give me that math right now, but <laughs> I'm very much interested in both student use and teacher use. Do you, can you do that? Sure, I can, I can, so how it, how it keeps tracks of it, it you know, it, there's hits analytic um, it's, it's, it's behind the scenes. Yeah. So over the course of, say, from between September up till today, uh, I think I have a quick note here. Just So our staff has about an average of uh, 1,000, uh, sorry, 120,000 hits per day, just as a perspective. Yeah, QPS staff accesses Aspen yep. 120,000 times a day. Yep, is that on average. Saying? Okay. Yep. Um, and then, so for students, there are about 70,000 hits average per day. And at the moment, our families are about 18, uh, 1,800 uh, hits per day. But do note that some of our families are using the student accounts to check uh, on their students' gotcha. progress as well. Yeah. So, yep. The, um, and, and can you, and I don't, I don't need this data now, but... Um, can you tell uh, percentage of QPS students that use Aspen, you know, percentage of um, teachers that use Aspen? You don't, you don't need to report out. I mean, the, the, the usage, the daily usage is staggering, is what, you know. Yes. So those numbers eclipse what I was going to say. So 
But if you're willing to share your, your talking points, I'd, I'd love to look at those and whether we have a discussion sure. or we bring you up, because I'm very excited that you're here. Yeah. So, and uh, <laughs> as for Kelly, first of all, Kelly, I am super excited in light of what we just went through to welcome somebody from another school district to the city of Quincy. <laughs> it's so great that you wanted to come to the city of Quincy. I think, I think that's terrific. And, and the other thing, you know, my day job, I'm, I'm a public affairs director for a federal agency and run kind of a digital media group. So the analytics excite me. All of that excites me. So as you learn and grow and do that, and one of the things that we talked about, and I'm sure Laura and, and the superintendent, so thank you for this position. One of the things that we talked about with the school improvement plans last year was you know, all, all of the school websites were tired, and, and it's the front door to the, the school. And, and the principals do an amazing job communicating in so many different ways. But when you go to the front door of the website, there's, you know, everything was stale, web rot, everything else. So, and the engagement strategies and the images and all that stuff, super exciting. So I, I can't wait till next year to hear about all the technology we're investing in the building, how we're, uh, you know, some of the Aspen issues and then uh, the digital media. So I'm, I'm pumped about this presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Hughley. Thank you. This is a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. And I'm going to say I'm, I'm an avid Facebook user. So Kelly, I've seen your work quite a bit. And I think I'm very impressed. You're doing a great job. Thank, thank you, you very much. Mrs. Lebo. I just want to reiterate, you know, one of the things when we went through the school improvement plans, and this is a typical way the school committee does their job, is we saw how bad the websites were and how stressed our principals were mm -hmm. to think that they also had to do that when they didn't really have the, 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 the background or the time to do it. And we came back to this body and asked, can we get a position so these people can get some help? And uh, that's how it works. And here you are. And I can't get over the difference. Because every, so every school improvement plan I see, I open up their way, their their website, yeah. and you know just to check on things and see the newsletter, and I I cannot get over the difference. So I think that this is another addition to a stellar team, and I am so glad you're there. And I did I didn't see all three of those, but I saw two of those posts on Facebook. I don't know why I'm not seeing all. <laughs> I saw two of them. And it, it, and just, the the numbers alone of how many people have seen it and shared it is. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, it's like every parent and grandparent and cousin and aunt at Berners Island yeah. <laughs> yes. shared yes. that out and showed somebody. And that's just the second grade. So it was amazing to see those numbers. Um, I have one question. On page nine of your plan, I see five TBDs. Does that mean we have five openings or we would like five positions? Nope, there's, there's definitely five openings. We have five openings? Yeah, it's been a challenge to, to hire the technicians. Well, IT obviously, technicians, ISSN, as well as is the, as a, ISSN is a problem. Yes, it so is. I can understand that it's also a problem for you. But I'm pleased that we actually are looking for these people. I mean, they're specialists for sure. And, and it's, a, it's a tough, the ones that we have have a lot of work. Yes, of course. So I'm glad that we're trying to find some relief for them, for these people who have been doing this for years, but they because we see the difference in how much technology we have, of course. we recognize that we need more people to give this kind of support. And you know, maybe we could start looking at some of our ISSN graduates from the past few yes. years. Yes, of course. We might be able to come back. And I think that might be where you got some of your current members. We do, we do. And once again, two of those, two of those positions are addition positions, thanks to you and the members of the school committee. Last year, you voted on two additional we, positions. We asked for that too, yes. yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Bergoli. Just a quick question on, on Aspen. How difficult is it to, uh, for a teacher to access that, and how much time does it take, particularly at the high school level, um, where they have not 30, 20 kids in front of them, they have 130 uh, to you know, get out the information to uh, parents and the students? Sir, uh, could I clarify like access? So as far as logging in, it takes them a, a few seconds, if that, uh, and looking through their grade books, looking at their rosters, I had time you know, less than a minute. Um, uh, but, you know, um, I'm, I can't speak for, you know, uh, <laughs> what it's like in the classroom when you're trying to log in, perhaps, during that time. Um, I don't know what the, so, yeah. I mean, if, is it a specific item that they're trying to accomplish? That, that varies. I'd say. But as far as getting into Aspen, seconds if that. All right, thank you. Yep. 
Anybody else? I just want to say um, welcome to Kelly. I, you know, I was having anxiety for Laura back in the day when she used to have to like <laughs> oh, us to see you all, and I, and I would say you need someone to take this over. So, so there needed to be someone. I think we all understand that, you know, for um, websites and social media, and someone needs to own it. And um, so I'm happy that we got to take that off of Lara's plate. And any organization that's successful um, needs a strong IT team, you know, for data collection, <coughs> just for everyday um, workarounds and all that. So thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing, and welcome to the system, you know, great addition. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we need a motion to continue uh, the meeting after 930. Yeah. So on a motion of Mr. Bergoli, no. Second. <laughs> second, second by Mrs. Cahill, we uh, yeah. superintendent call the roll. Mr. Bergoli? Yes. Mrs. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gatro? Yes. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mr. Santoro? Yes. And Mayako? Yes. <laughs> well, I just want to say hello again, Mr. Pacho. Nice to see you. It's, it's been a few years. It's been a few years. But uh, I'm happy you, you are where you are and you're helping us. I just want to know, oh, Mrs. Lebo. I was just going to make a motion to accept. The oh, one second. Go right ahead. I just want to know, um, now that we can use Aspen to build schedules, what are the principals and the guidance councils going to do all summer long? <laughs> I only say that in, in joke. But uh, thank you for all that you do. You've certainly taken us from where we were to where we're going. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. On a motion. Well, just before that, on that, I I really miss the days when we used to sit in that room with that giant board and plug all those classes in <laughs> with every department head in the high school. I miss those days, Mr. Santoro. Um, but on a, motion, a motion to accept the plan. And this second. motion of Mrs. Lebo, seconded by Mrs. Hubley. We accept the plan. Superintendent? Uh, Mr. Bagoli? Yes. Mrs. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gatro? Yes. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mrs. Santoro? Yes. And Mayor Cope? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, Superintendent Item B, 2022-2023 goals. This is a referral uh, by Mrs. Lebo and uh, Mr. Mulvey to uh, go to the Teaching and Learning Subcommittee. I guess that's all we need to discuss. Going to Item C, we have a donation, 50 tickets. Uh, Superintendent. Yes, thank you. Motion to accept. On a motion of... Um, May a Coke to accept, seconded by Mrs. Lebo, we accept the donation of 50 tickets for a Christmas carol to the North Shore Music Circus for Atlantic Middle School. On the, on the motion? On a motion, Mrs. Lebo. Mr. Superintendent. I just wanted to give a, a little additional detail on, those, on that donation. Uh, so the donation to Atlantic Middle School recently received a generous donation from Uncle Sam Rosenville and Gene Kenny, 51 tickets to a performance of a Christmas carol at the North Shore Music Theater on December 16th, valued at $2,550. And of course, we'd like a motion to accept the donation. Thank you, Uncle Sam. On a motion of Mrs. Lebo, seconded by Mrs. Hubley, we accept that gift. Thank you. Thank All you. All in favor? All in favor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. We have a donation of $14,000 uh, from the Randy Wolf Trust. Mr. Superintendent. Thank you. Uh, the Quincy Public Schools Music Program recently received a donation of 14000 from the Randy Wolf Trust. This annual donation is funded by the royalties from Mr. Wolf's music publishing catalog and greatly appreciated by our instrumental and choral music programs. If we could have a motion to accept the donation. Sure. Motion, motion of Mr. Cutro, seconded by Mrs. Uh, Cahill. We accept. Anything on the motion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. We have a donation of 3000 from City Kids, City Realty, Superintendent. The City Realty Group recently made a donation of $3,000 to support Quincy Public School students through the City Kids Foundation. The donation will support the work of Leslie Britson with teenage students struggling with homelessness. Thank you uh, to the City Realty Group. If we could have a motion to accept the donation. On a motion of uh, Mrs. Cahill, seconded by Mrs. Hubley, we accept. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank I you. Item F, School and Pro, uh, program Improvement Plan Development for a referral to the Teaching and Learning Subcommittee. Mrs. Lebo, any comments? Uh, no, we just we had made some changes this year and would like to have them memorialized. And when the plans come to us, we'd like to make sure that's in them. <laughs> okay, so it's referred. Item G, year-long school committee agenda for a referral <coughs> to the policy subcommittee. Mrs. Hubley, any comment? 
Uh, this was just something that came up at the Mass Association of School <coughs> Committee Conference that I wanted to refer in for our committee members to discuss. Okay, so be it. Item H, 2023-2024 School Committee Meeting Calendar for referral to the Policy Subcommittee. Mr. Bogoli, any comments? Nope, just going to refer it, and uh, same with the uh, QPS school year calendar. So move for items H and I. Item J, student travel, in-state overnight, uh, March 8 to 10, 2023, for the Quincy High School Student Council to the Massachusetts Association. Motion to approve. Motion of Mayor Koch, seconded by Mrs. Hubley. We approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Only roll call for that one? Roll call? Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, no. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Item K, student travel out of state overnight, April 7 to 11, for the North Quincy High School uh, Junior AF uh, ROTC to Motion Valley to Court. Approve. Motion of Mr. Shubley, seconded by Mayor Koch. We approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to communications. Upcoming school committee meetings, January 11 and 25, February 8 at 6.30 at Coddington. Upcoming subcommittee meetings, we have a few time changes. Athletics and Wellness is December 14th, but it's at 7 o'clock. The Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion is December 14th, but that's at 6.30. The policy is December 14th at 6 o'clock, not 7.30. January 18, 7 o'clock. Quarterly budget and finance, January 18 at 6 o'clock. Facilities, transportation, and security, January 18 at 6.15. Thank you, Mrs. Owens, for making those dates possible. Uh, number eight, reports of subcommittees. Teaching and learning subcommittee, Mrs. Liebel, to report on the November 28th, 29th, and 30th meetings. Yeah, on the November 28th meeting, we heard and approved the Point Webster, Marshall, Squander, and Montclair School Improvement Plans. I'm not going to go into great detail of these plans because they're all individual for the schools, and I suggest that the community that goes to those schools take a look at these plans. Um, at the next night, on the 29th, we heard Lincoln, Hancocks, Wallace, and Marymount, and Parkers, and again, all of these plans were approved by the school committee. And... The notes for those are on the, the, the website. And on the school website, Ms. Owens, are they on? Yes, they're really they're really on the school, school websites website. as well. And on the 30th, we heard Atherton House, Bernazani, Snug Harbors, and Beechwood. And again, those pro program improvement, school improvement plans were all approved, and they are on um, the website as well. We had some questions around the local survey, but we're going to be getting a, an update of that. And we wanted to make sure that parents' involvement is at all of those school improvement plans before they come to us next year. But otherwise, they're very individualized to the schools, so I suggest that the community look at their own school's plan. Thank, Thank you. you, Mrs. Lebo. Item B, Policy Subcommittee. Mr. Bergoli to report on the November 30th meeting. Mr. Uh, Bergoli. On November 30th, the uh, Policy Subcommittee uh, uh, met. Uh, we re reviewed the uh, staff survey on student use of personal electronic devices. Um, a revised draft policy was also shared with the school committee for their review. Mr. Guthrie, so the survey comments uh, showed that some staff would like discretion to allow for use of cell phones as part of instruction. Uh, exceptions to that policy are available for 504 and IEPs at the principal's discretion. Ms. Roy and Ms. Perkins said the digital literacy curriculum addresses safe uses of computers and cell phones beginning in the elementary schools. Ms. Perkins said the Chromebooks for instruction allows for certain apps to be blocked. Mr. Santoro said this is a, is a concise policy to be shared with all students, staff, parents, and guardians. Mr. Cahill said that comments cited parents text with students during the school day ask about how we can share the message with parents on calling the school in case of an emergency rather than use a cell phone. Mrs. Hubley noted that one uh, comment supported the idea that students are commuting, communicating to meet up for vaping. Other school districts are reporting a decrease in vaping incidents with the strongest cell phone policy. And Mrs. Leo spoke of a problem called Smart Pass, where students log in to leave a classroom, so that it limits the number of students out of class in the same area of the school. Uh, and Mr. Gutzow asked for clarification on the disciplinary section. Uh, Superintendent Mulvey said it gives schools flexibility to impose discipline with the administration supporting teachers. The policy can, uh, can be adjusted if needed after the full rollout. Um, uh, the, it was approved um, 
and the, the whole text is on online. So, thank you, Mr. Pergoli. Okay, motion of Mrs. Cahill, seconded by Mr. Catro, that we adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to all of you, and thank you for staying so late. Thank you.